How has the war machine helped the world in any real way? Most of us who aren't profiting off war don't want anything to do with it. I I wish we weren't trying to get better at it. I want less of it. I wish the computers could help us with that. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. I'm not going to pretend the nation isn't in absolute chaos. The fact that Donald Trump is still the Republican frontrunner, the amount of voter suppression and undemocratic behavior happening in the states, the Christian nationalist the GOP chose to be Speaker of the House, the dichotomy between what the two parties stand for has never been more glaring, which is why I want to talk to you today about a really important big picture idea, which is the rise of AI as it pertains to warfare. We can't pretend the world isn't on fire right now or that authoritarianism and terrorism aren't on the rise all over the world and realistically right here at home. So the question is, as computers get smarter, who do we want regulating them? Who do we want in charge of programming them? And ultimately, who do we want leading our country and our military response when AI is in the mix? Because if we get this wrong, how we feel about things like taxes, religion, racism, those will be the very least of our problems. I'm warning you ahead of time that this episode is kind of scary, but it's also incredibly important and one that I think is really worth your time. To have this essential conversation with us, I'm joined today by Ross Anderson. Ross is a staff writer at The Atlantic, where he covers science, technology, and culture. He was previously the magazine's deputy editor and recently spent a significant amount of time at OpenAI's headquarters in San Francisco and traveling through East Asia with its CEO, Sam Altman, for a major essay that came out in the September issue of The Atlantic. Ross is also writing a nonfiction book for Random House about an ambitious team of scientists trying to make contact with intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. I'm having him on today to discuss his article from the June issue of The Atlantic called Never Give Artificial Intelligence the Nuclear Codes. And I'm having him on because I'm still thinking about that article six months later. This is big deal stuff and something we have to consider as citizens of the world, but also as citizens of this powerful nuclear superpower going into an election year. At the end of the day, we need to be very deliberate about who we want making these life and death decisions on our behalf, who should be at the helm as the computers get smarter and the world gets harder. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, author, essayist, and staff writer at The Atlantic, Ross Anderson. Welcome, Ross. Lee, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for coming. I I reached out to you because I really enjoy your work. And you're able to take these incredibly complicated issues and make them way more understandable for us normies. And I really appreciate Mm. it. You're not a normie, but I I appreciate that myself. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so the article that we are going to be talking about starts by saying, no technology since the atomic bomb has inspired the apocalyptic imagination like AI. And you point out that ever since ChatGPT began exhibiting these kind of glimmers of logical reasoning, the internet has been like overwhelmed with these doomsday scenarios about how it's going to ruin everything. And I think most of us are familiar with Terminator, but none of us really want to live it, right? You get all these scenarios when you go deep on these message boards of like people thinking 20 steps into the future as to how, you know, an artificial intelligence, something like a souped up chat GPT could possibly like manipulate a person into doing, you know, things that set the world afire. And yet uh, it occurred to me and has occurred to others, I should say, that one thing that AI might do is be quite dangerous in combination with nuclear weapons. Since those are the most dangerous technologies we have, maybe we ought to start there when we're thinking about existential risk and AI. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's more than just the fear of the robots taking over, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. what are we allowing them to take over? And your article did focus on this very real fear of the integration of AI into warfare. And it strikes me that that's something we really need to be considering right now as America Mm -hmm. plays an allied role in two wars and potentially Mm -hmm. more on the horizon. And As you say, no one is currently inviting AI to strategize our war plans or join in meetings with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But like, how many years until AI moves up that chain of command? Like, how fast will technology advance? And it does appear to be advancing quite quickly. We need to make sure that the humans are smart enough to act with the appropriate restraint so as not to just defer all our decisions to them at some point. You know, at this point, right, like AI is being used, you know, you could think of it as a soldier, right? right? Like we have drones, for instance, there's work on tanks, there's work on like automated F-16. So it's sort of like 
the AI is out in the field as an individual, possibly making decisions, in certain cases, maybe even making kill decisions. Um, but that's a really murky and complicated topic. The question that, as you say, this piece focuses on is what happens when AI is invited to move up the chain of command, right? So, you know, as one scenario where they might, that might be quite a compelling option, I mean, one thing that I don't want to do is pretend that these will only be temptations for really villainous types who want to end the world by using AI, right? Like, I think people who are looking at a geopolitical setting that we have now, where you have multiple major powers um, with nuclear weapons, you know, you could imagine a world in which, especially as we deploy more autonomous weapons, uh, you might think that an AI that can hold like 2000 variables in its mind at one time constantly for a week at a time would be better than a general in the battlefield. So if you're fighting a war with tens of thousands of drones in the South China Sea, for instance, um, an AI general actually might prove quite compelling. And I think that's those are going to be the sort of times where we really have to decide whether that's a road we want to go down. You use the example in your article of the director of the War Gaming and Crisis Simulation Initiative at Stanford, and she devised this game in 2018 about this quickly unfolding nuclear conflict. And she said it had been played by everyone from former heads of state to foreign ministers to senior NATO officials. And she believed the game gave us this insight into the decisions these type of people might make when the stakes are that high. Do you want to tell us a bit about that crisis simulation game so people understand what these people who with these high amounts of power were playing and what the results they found were? Fortunately, um, we don't have a lot of case studies for nuclear br brinksmanship, right? It's not something that's happened a ton of times. It has happened a few times, but it's not something that's happened a lot of times. And so, you know, anyone who are looking to put together like a really empirical game theory of it is going to have a hard time. And so war games, uh, which have their issues otherwise, for instance, they're usually a lot of times they're used to uh, pursue various kind of pre-existing agendas. But war games in this instance can be very useful. This one uh, really appealed to me, has like big Tom Clancy energy. Uh, it's like, you know, you can imagine the, the president and the cabinet, you know, have just been hustled into the basement of the West Wing. They're receiving this dire briefing, you know, a territorial conflict has turned hot and the enemy is uh, mulling, for whatever reason, a nuclear first strike on the United States. And you can imagine what the situation room would be like in that setting. I, the atmosphere would probably be quite charged. Um, you know, you'd have probably factions between hawks and doves and the hawks would be saying, hey, we need to have immediate preparations for a retaliatory strike. If not a first strike, then there's this wrinkle in this war game, which is that, you know, someone else stands up and says, we've just had intelligence that suggests that the enemy also has a cyber weapon and that cyber weapon might compromise our communication systems in nuclear command and control. And that's a lot of jargon. So let me just say that nuclear command and control is the system that we use for the president to you know, make orders that are then received by missile silos or submarines or any other assets that we use to launch nuclear weapons. And so the president, upon hearing this, right, is in a really tough situation because they don't know whether their commands will reach their nuclear forces. You know, there are no good options in this scenario. Uh, in fact, one of the most common things that people do, which is also very scary, is delegate launch authority to officers in the field. You know, there's a reason we only vest that power in one person, right? Like once you expand it for all kinds of reasons, you can get into really tricky scenarios. But one of the other ones, and this is where we connect uh, to our conversation about AI, is that many, many times, and again, this game is being played by very serious people, not like jokers like you or I, who have no experience, um, <laughs> or not you, I should say. Jokers like me. Yeah, no one cares <laughs> what we think about, about launching exactly. nuclear weapons. <laughs> <laughs> like, presumably, these people have thought about it before, right? In a way that I might not have before encountering this game. And yet, one of their dominant responses was to automate command and control, which is to say, to give AI the power to launch nuclear weapons. And uh, like Dr. Schneider, who ran this game, I just found that really chilling and really revealing as to where we're going. Well, this is really what people need to understand. So you're in this situation where there's going to be an enemy that will have a nuclear strike on America. The question is, if we cannot communicate with the people that we would like to communicate during that 
incident, what do we do? And some people would say, okay, well, we'll just give the ability to decide if we send a nuke or not to people in the field. And we're like, well, we didn't give that person the authority to send a nuke or not. Why am I sending Joe Schmo, important military guy, but not the president of the United States, that authority? And they're saying, okay, instead of doing that, a lot of people in this simulation decided to automate that decision, to give the decision to a computer, that a computer would decide if a nuclear counterstrike was warranted. A computer would decide if we should strike first or strike second or what we would do. And the creator of the game, who you're talking about, she's Stanford Hoover Institute's director, Jacqueline Schneider. She said she was most upset by this because in fear of a total breakdown of command and control, a lot of people chose to automate the nuclear launch capability completely by empowering algorithms to decide whether a nuclear counterstrike was appropriate. So in so many scenarios, these very important people, like you said, not yahoos like us, these really important people understand, chose to let AI alone decide if we entered into this nuclear exchange. And the director said that this impulse people had to give up power like this to a machine suggests what she calls wishful thinking about technology, that her concern is people will want to use AI to decrease uncertainty without understanding that these algorithms themselves are uncertain. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, you see that, uh, look, just to be vulnerable, I mean, I, I see myself doing that. When you're Googling the answer to a really difficult research question and you're getting kind of ambiguity and you don't know the sources, really tempting to just go at chat GPT, like, hey, what's the answer to this? And get like this really crisp and clean, you know, kind of well-written little response that because it sort of has the, the atmosphere of cold computer logic, it can be really compelling and persuasive. And so when you're now falling for that same little trick, but when the, the stakes are potentially human extinction, that is, uh, that's an entirely different gamble. And I think Dr. Schneider is right that, you know, especially in situations that are so charged, no human being can really keep their head in that situation, shouldn't be able to keep their head. Like it's really a kind of quite a dizzying thing. And I hope it never happens, by the way. Yeah. Um, but AI might be especially tempting there. Oh, well, the, these safe computers, you know, they'll help us. Like you're saying, we have this idea of computers being this kind of emotionalist decider, this cold mm -hmm. decision maker, you know, taking the human fear and indecision out of the equation and making these purely logical choices. But as you write in your article, even with today's most advanced AI, we're dealing with what are called black boxes. So we don't entirely understand how they work. And you wrote, at the deepest and most important level, AI might not understand what Reagan and Gorbachev meant when they said a nuclear war cannot be won. In complex, high stakes, adversarial situations, we don't actually know what AI would really believe that winning was because it's not coming from what we would think winning was necessarily. We don't know what the computer would actually think. And then they're going to make that decision for us. And that's very complicated. You know, we have all kinds of examples where programmers um, who use, you know, I, I recently spent some time with the executives over at OpenAI. And, you know, before they started making ChatGPT and Dolly and all these fun tools, they were all in on games because, you know, five, 10 years ago in the AI space, games were thought to be like the thing that would generalize, not language models. And so, you know, famously AlphaGo is sort of the big one, you know, that uh, this AI that beat the world um, champions at Go. But they also, you know, uh, played these multiplayer video games. Dota 2 is a, is a famous one. And, you know, the AIs turned out to be quite good at these games. In fact, ended up beating the world champions, but their strategies were totally, totally unintuitive. Famously, uh, Lisa Dahl said that, you know, uh, when he matched up against AlphaGo, this Go playing AI, that uh, a human would have never thought of this strategy. And so we just don't know what sort of means by which an AI uh, may pursue victory in a nuclear war. And they might be, you know, they might, for instance, sacrifice quite a few civilians. Yeah. But, you know, oh, hey, we beat the, the enemy. Look, there's like a thousand of us left and none of them left. That, that might represent victory to an AI. And if we don't really carefully define what victory is, and even if we do carefully define it, 
because as you say, these AIs are black boxes, at least for now, we don't know how they're arriving at their conclusions. And that's really scary when you're talking about existential stakes. We have to think big picture. I mean, you you note in your article that even if AI isn't given authority over nuclear weapons, if they're given a wide enough berth over conventional warfare, they could end up making decisions that inadvertently escalate conflicts. So we end up launching nuclear weapons anyway. Like you put it in your article, if a computer has been assigned a goal, it could purposely engineer a battlefield situation that leads leads to a nuclear launch because their algorithm has decided that a nuclear weapon would best accomplish the goal that they were given, right? And you use this great example of this game you're talking about, um, this AI game Dota 2, where AI was designed to play against human players in this modified battle simulation game. And they ended up beating the humans over and over again with these strategies that the humans hadn't even thought about, mostly because the computer was perfectly willing to sacrifice a lot of their own fighters in a way that no human probably would. And it all ends up coming down to how AI understands its goals in the context of human life, I think. Because researchers, like you said, they've been They've trained AI to do a lot of things, and one of them is to play these various games, like you said, and they keep coming up with the same problem because AI's sense of what victory is can be confusing to humans. Like, you use the example in the article of an AI that was taught to play a game that wasn't a war game. It was just where players look for keys to unlock treasure chests and then secure rewards. And the AI was doing exactly what it was supposed to do until the engineers tweaked the game environment just enough so there were now more keys than there were chests. And the mm-hmm. AI on its own shifted tactics and started hoarding all the keys, even though many of the keys were useless. But they And they weren't even really trying to unlock the chest, as far as I understand. In that scenario, it seems like the AI was just trying to make sure no one else could win, as opposed to trying to win themselves. And we certainly don't want computers doing that with our warfare or with nuclear weapons, because that's way off script uh, for what would be best for humans. One view that you might take away from this issue uh, is that, okay, we're good so long as we don't give them the nuclear codes, right? Like, they can be five-star generals, but... Let's just keep them away from the nuclear codes. Cool. Ross, problem solved. Except that, of course, uh, not even at the four or five star general level, even, you know, well below that, these AIs, if they're good at building models of the world, right, there's every reason to believe that they are and they're getting better at it. If they're good at building models of the world, the nuclear weapons will be part of their strategic environment. They'll be part of the world that they're operating in. And so even if they don't have, it's not their thumb on the red button, they may (laughs) be tempted to use them. The idea here is that they'll be smarter than us. So they might have, you know, uh, many imaginative ways that you and I could sit in a a conference room for a week trying to spin out wild scenarios and still never land upon. You explain in the article, which I think is really smart, um, that in the latter decades of the Cold War, Soviet leaders Mm -hmm. were concerned about the ability to counter an American nuclear strike. And so they developed what was called the Dead Hand Program. Do you want to explain that program to us? Because I think that kind of tells us a lot about what we might give up to machines and then how it ends up being like a finger on the button. I know it feels weird to take a break from talking about something so serious to talking about products, but it's our sponsors that make this kind of conversation possible, whose generosity allows us to take these deep dives into important issues. And I'm grateful to take a minute to share these companies with you. Did you know that traditional bed sheets can harbor more bacteria than a toilet seat? Well, you do now. And those kind of germs on your bedding can lead to acne and allergies and stuffy noses. Plus it's just gross. Which is why I'm pleased to tell you that Miracle Made offers a whole line of self-cleaning, eco-friendly bedding, such as sheets and pillowcases and comforters that prevent up to 99% of bacteria and require three times less laundry. Miracle Made sheets are infused with silver that prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. Miracle sheets are also incredibly comfortable and they're luxurious without that high price tag of other luxury brands. But go and see for yourself. Go to trymiracle.com slash politics girl and try it today or gift it to someone this holiday season. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Save over 40% by using the promo code politicsgirl at checkout. And you will also get three free towels and save an extra 20%. It's a heck of a deal. 
And Miracle is so confident in their product that they've backed it with a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you will get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep today with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl and use the code politicsgirl to claim your three free towels and save over 40% off. Again, that is trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl to treat yourself, a friend, or a loved one this holiday season. For those who might not know, I have a very rare lung disease. And although scarring in my lungs is where the disease originates, it's actually my heart that's affected. So I know firsthand how important heart health is to your body, which is why I'm pleased to be talking about Humans Super Beat Heart Chews. Super Beat Heart Chews are an easy and convenient way to support healthy blood pressure and promote heart healthy energy. They're plant-based and stimulant free, so you get a green boost without the jitters. Paired with a healthy lifestyle, the antioxidants in Super Beats are clinically shown to be nearly two times more effective at promoting normal blood pressure than a healthy lifestyle alone. Super Beats is the number one doctor, pharmacist, and cardiologist recommended beat brand for cardiovascular health support, which makes it blood pressure support you can trust. If you find yourself drinking too much coffee or energy drinks just to keep your energy up, you can switch to Super Beat Heart Shoes, which are used by college athletes and pro sports teams to support performance and endurance. Double your potential with Super Beat Heart Shoes. Get a free 30-day supply of Super Beat Heart Shoes and 15% off your first order by going to getsuperbeats.com and using the promo code POLITICSGIRL. That's getsuperbeats.com, promo code politics girl. When we talk about the Cold War um, and the nuclear arms race that occurred during it, I think a lot of us have the sort of, we have the historian's common poise, you know, because we have the sort of, not all, but a lot of the facts before us now. And so we look back and say, oh, well, you know, we had this many missiles and they had this many. And so, you know, that's about where we were. But at the time, there was massive uncertainty on both sides. And one thing that we've pulled from the sort of 70 year experiment that we've had with nuclear weapons is that uncertainty is not great, right? Like you want certainty so that people have a really firm sense of like what sorts of actions will trigger escalations on the other side, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when the Soviets uh, feared uh, that they were falling behind in the nuclear arms race, they, you know, even said as much that they had this thing called the dead hand, which was the first AI doomsday weapon. It's the very first AI that was ever put in control of nuclear command and control. And, you know, it's, it's so simple that it's tempting not to think about it as AI or as an algorithm because it was such a, a simple thing. But um, the idea was that, you know, if a nuclear crisis were underway and if Moscow feared that they would be deprived um, of control over their nuclear weapons, they would turn this thing on and it would be subject to certain conditions. So, you know, if you saw this big blinding flash of light and then there was all this fallout or whatever it may be, and you weren't getting a response from your command and control, the thing would launch everything. It wouldn't just launch one thing. It would launch every single weapon they have. The way they did it was kind of ingenious. It would, a single ICBM would like launch up into the atmosphere and then like send flashing out um, uh, like radio Uh, directions to all the other silos to just, you know, it's time to launch. Yeah. And just so people understand, this program was something that would be activated during what they thought was a nuclear crisis, where the command and control centers outside of Moscow, if they stop receiving communications from the Kremlin, if that happened, this special machine would read the atmospheric conditions. And if the machine, you know, saw blinding flashes or surges in radioactivity, all the remaining Soviet missiles would be launched directly at the United States. And Ross writes about this program because Russia's always been kind of cagey if they had this system. But in 2011, Mm. a commander of the country's strategic missile forces said it still exists and it's on Mm. active duty. In 2018, a former leader of Russian's military forces said the program has actually been improved. And so here we are again, the concept being dead hand. Like if everyone in the Kremlin's dead because of a nuclear strike, this computer hits the, it uses the dead hand to hit all of the other nuclear weapons and send them to the United States. So it would be a, another a machine and not a human making that decision. And then America was like, if they have this program, we should probably have a program like it. So it's like, what happens is you get into this again, it's like an arms race, but with 
automation. You know, you think, well, if they have a computer that will launch weapons, maybe we should have a computer that will launch weapons. And it's a very scary proposition. And I think the thing, if you don't mind, Ross, can we just take a second here and I can back it up to make sure the people listening understand the current plan to deal with nuclear attacks. And I'll just basically quote your own article back to you. But just so everyone has a history of their, our reaction time to potential mm-hmm. nuclear attacks. And so historically, they see where we are in time. So in the early days of the Cold War, the preferred mode of a first nuclear strike was bomber planes, right? Like the ones we used over Hiroshima. You send a big plane, it's got a nuclear warhead attached to it, we drop it on the target. But these planes took a long time to fly, right? Between their locations. So between the Soviet Union and the United States, they would be piloted by human beings and they could be recalled. So knowing that's how the weapons would arrive, America built this arc of radar stations across the high Arctic and Greenland and Iceland. So the president would have maybe an hour or so of warning before a bomb dropped. And it would give us enough time to communicate with the Kremlin or shoot the plane down. And if all of that failed to order a full scale retaliator, retaliatory attack. Then in 1958, we got these intercontinental ballistic missiles, which cut that window to make decisions to about a half an hour, as hundreds of these ICBMs were put up all over North America, all over Eurasia, and a lot of them were able to cross the Northern Hemisphere in like less than 30 minutes. So to make sure we could best monitor those weapons, Russia and the U.S. responded by putting this extraordinary amount of satellites in space so they could spot an infrared signature of a missile launch, so they could mark the missile's path, so they could know its target. And then in the 70s, we got these nuclear-armed submarines. And then all of a sudden, all these missiles topped with nuclear warheads, these missiles that could go super fast, were all cruising around the world's ocean. And getting closer and closer to their targets, like basically cutting that decision window to do anything down to about 15 minutes, right? And then you point out 15 minutes, I'm sure most people can understand, it's just a ridiculously small amount of time to have a considered human response to such a huge crisis. Now we have to consider that nations are working on new missile technology, including hypersonic missiles, which Russia is already using in Ukraine right now because it's basically undetectable because it comes at you so fast that your like missile defense systems can't keep up. And we know that Russia and China want these hypersonic missiles to eventually carry nuclear warheads. And if they do that, then that would cut the 15 minute response time in half. So then we would have seven and a half minutes to make a decision about the fate of the world and what human could do that, which is what gets us back to AI, right? I mean, yeah. that's yes, that's the deal. Yeah, that's the deal. And that's why, you know, um, you talked to me, you know, when I was reporting this story, you, you talked to your buddy at the bar or whatever it may be. And people say, oh, that's cool. Like, that sounds like quite a speculative story. I'm sure no one's thinking of giving uh, nuclear weapons, giving AI control of nuclear weapons. It's a reasonable thought. I wish that were the case. And then you say, well, actually, the Russians did this already with dead hand. And also, there are people, senior people who were involved in command and control previously who have proposed this recently for those reasons that you just laid out. Because the decision window is shrinking, Maybe it makes sense to have a dead hand, they've said. I mean, these are serious people making proposals about that in the national security community. And you can understand why, right? And and I want to say, too, I mean, there are, you know, when it comes to the dead hand, for instance, or a proposal that the U.S. would have something like this, it can be difficult to disaggregate serious real plans from deterrence bluster, you know, and deterrence bluster can be useful, right? Like, Maybe it would be useful if for all of time, the US, China and Russia all said, hey, look, we've all got a dead hand. So just that would just put, you know, give us maximal deterrence. Everyone would kind of agree, okay, like the last thing we want to do is start a nuclear war because we all have these automated responses. All kinds of reasons I don't think we should do that, but you can understand why these people are, are proposing it. But uh, it's chilling. It is. And I mean, the American director of the Pentagon Joint Artificial Intelligence Center is very keen on AI. He's like, I can't think of anyone who's more keen on AI in the military than me. But when it comes to nuclear command and control, he even he is hesitant. And just so people know, uh, 
the Pentagon has been working really fast to automate America's war machine. According to a report in 2021, we have at least 685 ongoing AI projects, and the budget for AI in the military has only increased since then. And we might not know what a lot of these projects are, but we get the sense that the military is trying to automate a lot of things. And... Um, and, and most of that is good. Most of that is like tanks that will, you know, find uh, targets before the humans get there and can destroy them before the humans get there. And F-16s that will work in tandem with human pilots so that they can better dogfight and that kind of thing. This is all great. I know that we're using AI the way I think it should be used in early alert systems. So we're clear uh, and we're not making mistakes. We have more advanced knowledge. This is all terrific. But the question is, what comes next? What do we do next? As far as I know, AI isn't currently being asked to control troop movements or launch attacks. But I know the Pentagon did just update its policy saying it's going to allow the development of AI weapons that are allowed to make kill shots on their own. So they're planning to give computers the ability to operate as troops, which of course raises some important moral questions and brings us back to Terminator. <laughs> That's right. Right? I mean, listen, can I just yeah. say can I just say for a second like all of this work, reading all of your work, it just made me feel like ah, you know, like why yeah. do we want to be this good at war? Like why aren't we spending mm. more money and effort to be good at peace? Right? Like just yeah. continuing like this with the escalation, like you have it so I should have it. You have a dead hand, I should have a dead hand. You have computers in charge, I should have computers in charge. Like how does that improve our lives? Hasn't the how has the war machine helped the world in any real way? Most of us who aren't profiting off war don't want anything to do with it, right? We see the toll that it brings on everyone. And I, I wish we weren't trying to get better at it. I want less of it. I wish the computers could help us with that. There's a real argument to be made that, you know, some people, supporters of nuclear weapons might say, look, before nuclear weapons are invented, we were having a world war every 15 years. You want to go back to that? Once you have nuclear weapons, um, now great powers don't want to go to war, sort of recognized as this kind of totally awful thing that could even uh, bring about the extinction of the human race. Let's not do it. But to me, and, and people who have this view, they say, look, now we've gone 70, 80 years without such a war. These, you know, That totally vindicates the system that we have. We should be thankful for nuclear weapons. And I guess my feeling about that is I like to zoom out in time when you think about issues like this. And nuclear weapons could be around for 10,000 years. They could be around for 20,000 years as sort of the, the max weapons that humans have on this planet. Um, there's no reason, there's no technical reason they, they couldn't be. And when you think about that, then you realize, okay, a 70 year record, which by the way, has contained many near misses, is nothing. It doesn't tell us anything about how safe it is to have these big weapon systems pointed at each other. I mean, I often think about this I'm writing a book about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And I always think about like, imagine, you know, you get into some radio telescope messaging conversations with ET and you're the one who's like, has to tell them about mutually assured destruction. Just imagine explaining it, right? It would sound crazy. Like, oh yeah, we've got all these weapons pointed at each other so that like, if there's one false move, you know, everyone on earth dies. Tough thing to explain, not very compelling. Well, it's it's a tough thing to complain to explain to a human. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. I remember, like, you don't have to be an ET. I can remember it so distinctly when my parents explained it to me, and I was probably about ten years old, and I felt so astounded that we would have created such a thing. It's the questions posed by the Oppenheimer movie that everyone saw, you know, this mm -hmm. year. You know, it's like, is it was it a good thing? Did we deter the world wars that were happening every fifteen years, or did we? ruin everything by by putting this much danger in the world and it's these are important questions because like you said like we have these near misses in our history it's only mm. a 70 year history and like you, you say in your article that stanislav petrov should have statues to him all over the world because mm. he basically saved us from nuclear annihilation yeah no i there's a number of people who don't have nearly the recognition they do for walking us back from the brink but petrov is a, an interesting case and kind of the canonical one. And, and basically, you know, these Russian censors, uh, it's a bit of semantics as to whether you might consider them AI, but they picked up some like basically kind of sun glitter on the tops of the clouds in Montana, which is where we have a lot of missile silos and 
the way those were computed in their sensor systems, they were perceived to be an incoming launch. And so, um, you know, they started warning, the klaxon started going there, and it was up to Petrov as to or- order a counterstrike. And he, you know, kept his head about him and said, that's probably a false alarm. Like, there's no real tensions right now. You know, I mean, there, there were tensions, but it's not like peak tensions. No one's on a war footing necessarily. Let's wait and see. And we need people who are going to say, let's wait and see. And the other, I mean, to me, um, that makes him a huge hero. And like I said, there have been other near misses, but that one's kind of the cleanest story. But also the other people that I, I it's crazy to me that George W.H. Bush and Gorbachev yes. don't have Nobel Peace Prizes. Already. Yes. I mean, you know, they, because of the treaties that they signed and set in motion, nuclear stockpiles came down by like, you know, five times. We got to this stable point where it's like both countries have maybe a thousand or whatever it is. The numbers elude me right now. And now we don't live in that world, right? We're in a rearmament phase, which is depressing. I mean, I talked to people. I was at a dinner recently of people who are disarmament types and who are policy people who work in the field. And, you know, 10 years ago, they were all sort of busy developing quite utopian dreams about how we, you know, keep the momentum going on those serious reductions and get all the way down to maybe like 50 or 100 each or maybe like 25 each, you know, um, or have some common stockpile in Antarctica, whatever, in case there's an asteroid or something, you know, like whatever it might be. And now, that all they're they're interested in is like how can we keep the status quo, and it's going to be difficult because you know China is is expanding their their stockpile and we're on this sort of war footing with Russia. They've pulled out of our arms control treaties, and so I think you might see this this new period of proliferation, and that's that's really sad. Yeah, and just so people understand uh, what Ross is talking about, he's talking about in the 90s, during kind of a relative moment of peace, George H.W. Bush and Gorbachev realized that this kind of back and forth competitive weapons development would only end up ever increasing our nuclear warheads to our world's detriment. And so to their tremendous credit, and like he's saying, I mean, really, we really should give them the credit, they refused to keep doing the arms race thing. And instead, they got together and they signed the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, the first in a sequence of treaties that kind of cut the nuclear arsenals in both countries down to about a quarter of their size. But we're back at it now, right? Like a lot of those treaties expired. Others were diluted as the relationship between the US and Russia cooled. And now we're closer than ever to an outright war with this superpower than we've been in generations. Putin's already said that Russia is suspending its participation in New START, which was the last arsenal limiting treaty that we had. And as Ross is mentioning, we can't forget that China is in the mix now, right? Like they already have enough missiles to destroy every major American city. And the Chinese generals are seeing the leverage that Russia has with their nuclear weapons during this war in Ukraine that America's only willing to do so much to not start a nuclear war. And they're watching it as a possibility for themselves. So this idea of mutually assured destruction that we would have to explain to the aliens or our children with Russia is in many ways now a three-way with Russia and China and America, with every party pursuing new technologies to help them in this war. And and I, I just have to tell people, this is just another reason why we have to be supporting the Ukrainians in their war against Russia. Because as Mitch McConnell said, no Americans are getting killed in Ukraine. We're rebuilding our industrial base at home. And the Ukrainians are destroying the army of one of our biggest rivals without a single American soldier on the ground. And so it's hard to see that a problem with that. And everyone should understand that supporting Ukraine is actually in America's best interest because the worse Russia is doing, the less they can be putting into their nuclear plan and the more tempered China will be seeing it play out, right? So there's really no better way to be spending our defense money right now than making sure Russia loses this war. And anyone that tells you differently is not working in America's best interest. I think we also need to be really clear of how important it is of who we elect to be in charge of all of this. Because I'm sure you can tell from this conversation that Ross and I are having that our government needs to be very thorough and very deliberate in how they approach nuclear war, nuclear proliferation, AI. And if this conversation 
does anything other than terrify you, which I'm sorry, happy holidays. <laughs> it should serve as a reminder of how important it is that we put someone responsible and not insane or in unbalanced or uh, not educated in this kind of warfare and world in the role of president because we need to have someone who is stable and uh, responsive to this kind of high stakes situation that they have to deal with. It is important that we fill these military positions that are currently being left open. These are the people helping guide the decision. It is important that we have a house that functions because the house is the one that controls the purse and declares war. These are all things that we can't take lightly. So how we feel about taxes or this group of people or that group of people or who we want to have a beer with, it's all irrelevant. The people we choose to put in power are in charge of our entire planet's life or death. We can't just vote arbitrarily in America. America's power is too great in the world to make that. We need to make responsible decisions when it comes to who our leaders are going to be because this is the kind of power they're playing with. Mm, that's well said. And I, you know, to return to that 10,000 year frame, one of the things that I often think about is again, if these weapons are around for that long, even under relatively stable geopolitics, that means that just by the sheer amount of time that has passed, the red button will be exposed to every kind of human personality and leadership, right? We've only had, you know, so many presidents who have been close to the red button and maybe they've had a kind of narrow band of personality types, maybe not. If, it, if it's a thousand years or 10,000 years, you're going to have many, many, many more types of people who are going to have that proximity to that awesome, decisive power and terrifying, decisive power. And so, as you said, we need to choose carefully. The other thing I wanted to say, just because you mentioned China, just one of the things that's working against disarmament is we in the UK uh, have approached China and said, hey, let's let's get you on board with the um, with the arms reductions and the Chinese and in my view, of kind of quite a compelling retort, which is we have less than you now. And so we actually don't even want to sit at the table until we have as many as you. If you want to bring yours down to where we're at, great, let's sit down. But until that happens, like don't even broach the conversation and it's hard to fault them. I mean, and honestly, it doesn't look like we're probably going to have peace anytime soon. It's a volatile time in world history. But if we ever get back to a place like that again, hopefully with proper leadership, we should be really drawing on inspiration from people like Bush and Gorbachev. And I say that as a diehard liberal, right? Disarmament treaties are a great idea because they represent, as you said, human control. Maybe we should all agree at least, at the very least, maybe all these nations should agree to keep AI out of nuclear command for now. That's right. And and just know that these these peaceful moments are windows of opportunity, you know, and then that clearly, as we've seen, they, they don't necessarily last forever. Maybe they last a decade or two. And in that time, I think it's important to like push forward on priorities like this, uh, because when the peace goes away, as we're experiencing right now, things can unravel quite quickly. And as you said so beautifully at the end of your article, if errors are going to be the thing that deliver us into nuclear war, let them be human errors. Yeah, that we have this theory, you know, that we've been moving away slowly and in fits and starts from tyranny, you know, from the decisions of the few running the world to the decisions of the many and democracies. And this would be like a nothingocracy. It'd be a machine made, no human making the decision. So that's not the direction we want to go, I don't think. I don't think so. I don't think so at all. I really... I really hope people can get their head around the importance of these giant issues that are facing us and who we put in charge of them, whether that's a computer or a better served human being. We need to make those choices deliberately and with intellect and with um, judgment, uh, poise. judgment, uh, yes, <laughs> with judgment, with great judgment. I want to thank you for joining us today, Ross, honestly, and for keeping us up to date on this kind of very serious and important work. Before you go, please tell people how they can keep up with you and follow what you do. Thanks for having me on the show. This has been so fun. Despite so fun matter. to talk about uh, the destruction <laughs> of our world. What a blast. Um, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Anderson with an E-N at the end. Uh, but more importantly, you can find me at The Atlantic. Um, uh, that's where I do most, if not all, of my writing. We always appreciate more readers. So come and find us. Oh, yeah. Please follow The Atlantic. Their work is so excellent. And I hope you'll come back again and talk about AI for Love good. You. Maybe we can have, have some hope in the new year. You can tell us about the aliens or about how it's going to help <laughs> the world. We can talk about that in 2024. That sounds good, Lee. Thank you again. So that was Ross Anderson, whose writing reminds us that AI is everywhere, including right up close to our nuclear arsenal. 
They may not have their digital finger on the button now, but do we want it to? And at the end of the day, who will make that call? These are the things we have to be considering. These are how serious the stakes are. And this is why we have to vote for smart, capable, thoughtful human beings who we trust to make these kind of life and death decisions under pressure. At the end of the day, it's not about politics. It's about survival. And I want to thank Ross for joining us today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now go out and make the world a better place. Until next week, peachy out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.